Hi, this is Western Civ 1. I'm Dr. Young. Um, this uh, particular lecture, um, the intent here is to talk about the Renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, this is a term that is, I think, common parlance. Um, most people are familiar with it and may associate the term with key figures like uh, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo or you know uh, some of these famous artists and inventors. Um, but the term itself has become intensely problematic in the study of history uh, because it's really, a, I mean, the term Renaissance in French um, with similar terms in other Romance languages and of course it's come into English as well means rebirth. And so for there to be a rebirth, something had to go away. Um, and uh, that's that to some extent is the problematic um, element of this. Uh, we have to, to wonder um, as historians, you know, if there is a massive change that happens in the 15th and 16th centuries such that things that had been lost uh, were brought back into place, um, that there were tremendous innovations. Uh, and that really is kind of the classic view of the Renaissance. Um, uh, the people of the 16th and 17th centuries used this term and really felt that they had brought something back that had been lost, that they were involved in a rebirth. Uh, but the term gained special resonance in the 19th century, especially with the publication of a work called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy by a Swiss historian named Jakob Burkhardt in uh, 1860. And uh, Burkhardt's project, and this is one of the most influential history books probably ever written, um, his project was to locate the beginning of modernity. Uh, he wanted to know when the modern world started. Um, and he had a number of criteria that he applied to the modern world. One of these is an awareness of kind of the individual, that each person has their own uh, you know, kind of personal um, awareness, self-awareness, as it were. Uh, he also wanted to know, you know, where the origins of kind of modern European governments began. Um, and anyway, there were a number of other uh, kind of ideas that he had about, or rather criteria that he uh, established for uh, locating the beginning of the modern world. And he found all of these in Italy in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and so there... You know, and, and to some extent, this view was already in place during the Enlightenment uh, and, and things like that. But uh, this notion that there is this sharp dividing line between the Middle Ages, which is another term invented by people in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, to characterize this period that came before theirs, that was stuck in the middle of the glories of antiquity and the glories of the, you know, their contemporary time. Um, uh, and, you know, so there was this notion that there was this sharp break in the 15th and 16th century from the Middle Ages to this new thing called the Renaissance, right? Now, that has been problematized. And to some extent, I think that, that Burkhardt's idea about the sharp break and about the beginning of modernity uh, continues to enjoy um, uh, approval um, among kind of the public, right? Uh, and I, I certainly, you know, grew up thinking this and was taught this in school. Um, uh, but for about the last century or so, almost a century, I guess, um, this has been problematized. In, in the 1920s, um, a Harvard historian named uh, Charles Homer Haskins wrote a book called The Renaissance of the Twelfth Century. Now that's, you know, the, the Italian Renaissance supposedly takes place in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, but Haskins found all of the things that Burkhart had 
labeled as part of the Renaissance already in operation very much in the 12th century. Um, and he depicted the 12th century as this time of great vitality, um, sort of the way that I have uh, described the High Middle Ages um, in this course. Um, and I think that, that Haskins was right about that, okay? Um, and subsequently, historians, you know, looking at the period uh, of the Carolingian rule, the time of Charlemagne, uh, labeled that a renaissance, right? Um, and, and eventually this term just loses its meaning. Uh, the term means rebirth. Well, I think that we may get a sense that nothing ever really died, so nothing ever needs to be reborn, right? Uh, it is way overused. Um, and truth be told, historians today who work on the 15th and 16th centuries, even, you know, kind of work on the Italian setting, the art and architecture and things like that, don't tend to use the term Renaissance, um, or they at least qualify it a great deal. Art historians probably use it more than any other because it, you know, there, there are a number of kind of artistic motifs and styles and things, and some of, we'll look at some of that in the course of this lecture, uh, that are um, germane to that time, and these are quite innovative. Uh, and so I think you'll, you'll find this still in use in art historical circles, but, but historians, uh, tend to refer to this period as the late Middle Ages or the beginning of, of what's called the early modern period. Um, and the emphasis often, I would say most often, is on continuity rather than on change. So things didn't just like all of a sudden stop functioning one way and start functioning a totally different way. People didn't, you know, suddenly um, out of the blue find themselves in the modern world uh, gain an awareness of the individual and, and all of that, um, that this was a much more gradual evolution and that there was a great deal of uh, kind of continuity of institutions and, and uh, culture and ways of thinking uh, that persisted over some time, right? Um, certainly the politics of Europe um, uh, were really sort of the, characterized by much greater continuity, say, between the late 11th and the end of the 18th century than they were by any kind of sharp break. Uh, so politically, I think that this term is problematic. And I, I'm, this isn't going to be an exhaustive um, exploration of the Renaissance period. I'm going to focus on some specific things. Uh, and the first kind of theme I want to look at, because it underlays a lot of other, um, uh, the cultural stuff that, that we'll be paying attention to here, is the political situation in Italy. Right? Italy um, and and this, this is something that was already in formation, and we've talked about this already in this class, that Italy was home to a lot of large and important cities. It was the most urbanized region of Europe. It was the most commercially vibrant region of Europe all through the High Middle Ages uh, that cities like Florence and Genoa and Venice uh, had emerged as really quite powerful cities uh, even to the point where they challenged um, their overlords, the German emperors, and uh, to some extent even challenged the power of the papacy. By the 15th century, due in part to the weakening of the German emperor, um, the emperors were, I mean, from the, from the death of Frederick II in 1250 uh, on, the German emperors were really quite weak. Um, and uh, most of their power lay north of the Alps, though they did try to establish some kind of hegemony uh, over Italy. They were not very successful at this. They began to turn their attention elsewhere. Uh, we see the, you know, the German uh, emperors uh, focusing a lot of attention on what is now Austria, for instance. The Habsburg uh, family becomes the imperial uh, uh, dynasty. Um, the Habsburgs you know, reign in Austria all the way to World War I, um, and they married into a lot of the other nobles, um, eventually into the rulers of Spain and uh, the Low Countries and uh, several other regions. By the early 16th century, Charles V, the, the uh, Holy Roman Emperor, um, the German Emperor, uh, I mean, held, you know, just an incredible amount of land in Western Europe. But he really wasn't a very powerful emperor in that uh, e each of these territories that he held 
um, operated along uh, uh, different lines. He, that there were different, a different situation, a different relationship that each of these regions had with the emperor, and he never tried to standardize any of this. And then his his empire was split up into two parts, um, uh, one half of it, or part of it, uh, Austria and, and uh, Germany went to his brother, and uh, his son Philip, who became Philip II of Spain, uh, took Spain and the Low Countries, and, and uh, you know, then we're fully into the, the kind of the early modern period, which takes us beyond um, the, the scope that I have laid out for this course, right? So the German emperors were involved in a, in a lot of other things, a lot of other parts of Europe, and their Italian adventures, which had been so important to them, uh, over the course of the High Middle Ages, uh, assumed a, a kind of lesser position in their in their politics. This gave the city states of Italy even greater independence than they had enjoyed previously. Um, this map, I think, does a good job laying out the uh, the political situation in Italy. You can see that Florence was not just a city. For instance, uh, Florence held a lot of territory, uh, pretty much the whole. Um, the whole region of Tuscany here, although they did split it with Modena um, uh, and Siena to some extent, but um, uh, this whole uh, area along the Arno River here um, was under the control of Florence. Um, just to the south of them, we have Siena, which is another powerful city-state, right? Uh, Modena and Mantua and Ferrara. Uh, Genoa held the whole coastline here. Uh, even larger in Italy were um, Milan, for instance, which was a, a powerful duchy up here, uh, Savoy, um, centered on the city of, of Torino or Turin, um, and especially Venice, uh, whose republic, really kind of a commercial empire, stretched not only um, uh, through the, the kind of the northern part of the Adriatic here, but even down the, uh, the coast um, of the Balkan Peninsula here, bordering on the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which... Uh, conquered this region in the, in the 15th century. So, um, you know, this, the, these are powerful city-states uh, whose grounding really was in their commercial success. They had products that they sold all through the Mediterranean, trading with Muslim merchants in Beirut and Cairo and Alexandria and Baghdad um, and uh, Constantinople, um, which in 1453 was conquered by the invading Ottoman Turks, and um, uh, even after that, the, the Venetians especially um, maintained their commercial position in the Eastern Mediterranean by creating trade alliances with the Ottomans, right? So commercial success of all of these city-states, um, Venice and Florence and Genoa um, uh, in particular, um, but a great deal of wealth, uh, you know, found its way into the coffers of the ruling families of these city-states. Um, there's a more traditional, we might even say feudal, situation in the southern part of Italy with the Kingdom of Naples, uh, which was the, the outgrowth of the Norman Kingdom of Sicily um, uh, in the High Middle Ages, uh, though the Kingdom of Naples did also have um, uh, more integration with the northern part of Italy um, as this period wore on. Uh, if you are familiar at all with, um, well, uh, among others, William Shakespeare was intensely interested in this, in this Italian situation uh, in the kind of late Middle Ages. Um, several of his plays are set in Italy and, you know, uh, play upon the factionalism and the contentions between these various city-states and duchies and kingdoms. Uh, the Tempest, for instance, has Prospero, who had been the Duke of Milan, uh, but he was overthrown by his brother, who has made an alliance with the King of Naples, um, and uh, Prospero is exiled to an island somewhere out in the Mediterranean, but through his use of magic and subterfuge and, and things like that, he's able to regain his position there and, and is able to maneuver uh, to, uh, his daughter to marry the, the heir to the throne of Naples. Right, um, and that's all very much in keeping with the kind of political situation here. Um, now, many of these city states uh, were dominated and and had been really since about the 12th century by powerful merchant families. The quintessential uh, family here is the uh, the Medici family in Florence, though they are only one of a number of um, 
powerful families in this period. Uh, the Medicis, who had emerged from the kind of the merchant class, uh, gained so much wealth that they were able to buy noble titles and effectively uh, hold their heads high uh, among all of the crowned heads of Europe in this period, and even marry uh, their their heirs and heiresses into the uh, royal families um, in France and Germany and, and other places. Uh, so you know that that's how much power these merchant families held. And for our purposes here, as we're looking at the uh, the kind of the cultural aspects of the Renaissance in Italy, there the patronage of the arts by these merchant families is key. Uh, the Medici's and others really put a lot into beautifying their cities um, and uh, uh, procuring personal collections of art. Um, they were not the only patrons, and and here. You know the Italian cities were often uh, sort of linked in with uh, with other powerful people in in, in Europe. Um, the Habsburgs in uh, in Austria and Spain, for instance, were patrons of Italian artists as well. Um, the artist Titian, for instance, did a lot of work um, for uh, the Spanish royals, and uh, much of this Italian art is housed today in museums like the Prado in Madrid, um, which has a whole hall basically dedicated to Raphael and Titian and, you know, some of these other Italian painters. Um, and uh, that's because the Spanish kings, you know, were uh, often involved in, uh, in Italy. Um, and Spain was not a united territory at this point, at least not until the end of the 15th century when, when uh, Ferdinand, who was the king of Castile, married Isabella, who was the Queen of Aragon, um, which united the two largest kingdoms in Spain. Um, and uh, they were, you know, they were patrons uh, of the arts as well. Um, so, you know, this patronage is key to the, the thriving culture uh, of this period. Now, culturally speaking, um, uh, the label that has been applied to the chief cultural movement of this period is humanism. And you may have encountered this in other classes talking about, I, I know that in first year seminar, for instance, I have taught a lot about humanism, uh, spent, spent a great deal of time looking at key humanist texts and things like this. Um, and humanism is not something that is necessarily uh, formed in the 15th century, though it does, uh, there are I think key advances in this um, in this way of thinking. Uh, scholars have have labeled you know scholastic uh, philosophy, for instance, an early form of humanism, though that that uh, uh, application is somewhat problematic. Let me break humanism down into um, some component parts here. First of all, the humanists were intensely concerned with language, with um, the proper use of language. Uh, it was felt that to be um, a gentleman, to be uh, a sort of worthy member of high society, one had to be a master of language. And for this, the humanists look back at, um, at the classical world, at, the, at antiquity. They, you know, read Latin literature religiously. They read Greek um, uh, and in fact, it was you know in this period that Homer was sort of rediscovered, for instance. Um, but the Italian, or the, rather the Latin classics, were particularly important to them. Um, and there was this idea that uh, humanism was bringing back the proper use of language. Um, that you know in antiquity they had enjoyed this sort of high style that indicated their um, how intelligent they were and how well formed their society and their and their culture and their politics were, um, how engaged they were, and that's actually the second point here, uh, with you know the key issues of the day. Um, and language permitted them to do this. Uh, and so you know this went beyond just the spoken language or the or the written language. They even felt that um, the style of writing was important, um, that they had to write beautifully. Uh, and so the you know humanist schools uh, taught people how to do calligraphy, essentially how to write in a in a beautiful script. They went um, and actually sort of rediscovered um, Carolingian writing in this period. They thought that that was 
uh, the writing of the ancient Romans, they found these you know manuscripts and things, and, and they, they began to imitate the the Carolingian minuscule um, that Charlemagne had been a patron of, um, believing that this was actually like ancient Roman stuff. Now, so the use of language is important, and, and naturally, you know, the growth of literature is a kind of byproduct of this. Another one is um, what we might call engagement here. Um, humanism believed that, well, I mean, sort of at its root, right, uh, the focus is on the human being. Now, we shouldn't um, uh, think automatically that humanism rejects God, right? I mean, God uh, and sort of the, the, the Christian God, at least, uh, had been the main subject of culture um, all through the Middle Ages. Humanism continued to embrace religion as its um, sort of foundation here. But there was this strong notion that human, the human being mankind, uh, was the pinnacle of God's creation, and that uh, the humanist properly ought to be engaged in questions of human capabilities, ought to work toward the improvement of humankind, um, uh, ought to, you know, uh, try to understand the human being as the pinnacle of creation. Um, and, you know, you can see this in, in the art. There's a, a great focus on getting the human being right, uh, a realism, as it were, um, to this, right? Um, we've got a couple of examples of art here on the slide. You have um, uh, the, the, the birth of Venus here. Um, and, you know, Venus is seen as this... Uh, uh, sort of ultimate um, uh, female figure, right? But the, the figure is very real. I mean, the anatomy is, is correct, as it were. This is not an idealized uh, figure, okay? Um, and then on the right here, we have Donatello's uh, David, um, one of two uh, sculptures of David um, that... Uh, uh, Botticelli, by the way, is the, the uh, artist who did The Birth of Venus. I forgot to mention that. Uh, but Donatello's sculpture of David here, um, David is a, a rather effeminate figure, actually, um, kind of a soft figure, but uh, seen as, you know, the, the ultimate male figure. Um, there's a reason that he's sculpted in the nude here, um, because the, the human body was a subject of fascination, and this went beyond just portrayals of the human body. Humanists wanted to understand what was inside, right? Uh, wanted to understand the body anatomically um, and, uh, and physiologically. Um, and so there's this engagement with, you know, sort of every facet of the human being, as it were. Um, uh, and, and also with uh, the capabilities of human beings, with uh, producing the, the kind of the ultimate society. There's a lot of utopian thinking in this period, and in fact, you know, um, Thomas More, who wrote the book Utopia in 1516, uh, is a, he, he's a humanist. Uh, he, he's a Northern European humanist. Um, but, you know, this humanism spreads from Italy into other parts of Europe and, and uh, is picked up by them. And, and so, you know, the, the growth or the engagement with questions of, of the perfectibility of human societies, the, um, uh, the development of these things uh, was important to these humanist thinkers. And then finally, an emphasis on achievement, right? Um, there's almost a competition between all of these humanist figures to, to one-up everybody else, to, uh, to produce something that it will be immortalized, um, that everyone will admire. Um, again, to demonstrate the capabilities of the human being, to show that the human is endowed with all of the gifts of God and that they ought to put these to use uh, in a wide variety of circumstances. Again, in the kind of perfecting of, uh, of society, um, uh, socially uh, and, and governmentally, uh, but also um, in understanding what humans are, are capable of, you know, physically and, uh, and all of that. And, and you know, the... Humanist thinkers are interdisciplinary. They, the humanist thinkers were, you know, literary uh, savants and artists and architects and 
and uh, engage politically. And, uh, you know, this is where we get the term Renaissance man, right, which wasn't necessarily used in this period. But the notion that, that uh, uh, you know, the learned humanist ought to be interested in everything um, was, was sort of key to the whole humanist project. Now, again, uh, a couple of other points here, uh, a lot of emphasis on the classics, the reading of the classics, the imitating of the classics, going back to Virgil and Homer and Ovid, um, imitating the high styles uh, oratorically and, and uh, rhetorically uh, of you know, Horace and Seneca and Juvenal and these great uh, Roman authors, as well as the, you know, the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato. Um, all of this is important to them. Um, uh, there's, you know, a lot of literary activity. The Renaissance is not just an artistic and ar architectural phenomenon. A lot of literary activity. Um, we could even go back to Dante and uh, Boccaccio to some extent, but Petrarch in the, in the 14th century is really seen as the harbinger of things to come literarily for the Renaissance. Um, uh, Petrarch admires, uh, maybe more than any other figure of that period, the classics for the beauty um, that they hold and tries to imitate that in his poetry uh, and then he's imitated by others who follow after him right um, now I want to look at just a few examples here and this is going to be a pretty um, paltry I think coverage but just a few examples to try to highlight some of these these trends in humanism um, uh, this this is the other figure you can compare Donatello's David here which is a much softer almost effeminate figure um, you know, this S-curve, uh, which shows the body in a, a kind of leaning position off-center, um, is, is one of the key features. You can even see it here with, uh, with the birth of Venus uh, to some extent, right? Um, and, you know, Michelangelo's uh, David also has this, all of the weight is put on the, on the right leg here, okay? Uh, one of the things about Michelangelo's David um, is that this thing is huge. I mean, it's like 17 feet tall or something like that. So this is uh, an attempt to um, kind of rediscover the Colossus, as it were, which is one of the, you know, artistic, or one of the artistic goals of the ancient world was to create these gigantic sculptures. I mean, this thing, you know, isn't like the Colossus of Rhodes, which um, uh, the legs of which span the harbor of, uh, of the island of Rhodes, for instance, but um, still a, a monumental figure here um, and the larger it is the more of the anatomy can be explored right um, you know if you compare this with medieval figures I mean there is no emphasis on realism right medieval figures uh, whether we're talking about sculpture or painting or, or whatever it is uh, are, are really um, there as placeholders for a larger narrative which involves God and salvation you know probably should have put some of these things on the slide, but, you know, we looked at some examples, for instance, of, of uh, Romanesque art, uh, art and architecture earlier in the course, and, you know, if you can compare this with, you know, the figures you saw in the Last Judgment uh, depictions in Romanesque um, sculpture, for instance, right, uh, where there, there really is no emphasis on the, uh, on the anatomy, on the physicality uh, of the human being, because that wasn't the important point. The important point was to show the human as a uh, as a small player in the broader narrative of salvation where God and Jesus, the, the Trinity, are the key figures. Well, humanism elevates the human being. Um, and so, you know, there's this emphasis on, on getting the human right here. And I think that Michelangelo's David probably goes a longer way to doing that than just about any other uh, depiction or sculpture. Um, the Sistine Chapel uh, ceiling uh, that Michelangelo painted um, the circumstances under which he painted this were really uh, kind of incredible physically demanding. You know, he laid on his back on scaffolding and painted this, uh, had to contort himself into the most uncomfortable positions to do this. Uh, but, um, you know, what he achieved is, is truly remarkable here. The most famous maybe depiction from the Sistine Chapel shows the creation of Adam by God here. And God is shown as a human figure. Um, sort of surrounded and supported by these angels, but he is you know, reaching out to touch Adam, and Adam, you know, much like David is shown with uh, sort of correct anatomy here, um, 
uh, you know, a, an exploration emphasis on the musculature, on, you know, getting the human being right. Adam is the, the first uh, human being, according to the Judeo-Christian uh, understanding, right, uh, would be, I suppose, the ultimate human figure, the ultimate man, um, as it were. Uh, and so Michelangelo tried to depict him as such here, right? Uh, and, and this really is a statement of humanism, right? That God uh, reserved the creation of the human for the uh, as his final act of creation. Um, that everything else was done before that, and then there's this moment where God and and human being or God and man touch, right? And and uh, and man is created in the image of God here. Um, and the then and you know the human is is in fact the only uh, figure who was created in the image of God. Um, and so Michelangelo is trying to to sort of capture that sentiment. Um, architecturally, we can see an emphasis, or rather an imitation, of classical styles. Uh, unlike the Gothic, which is very busy. Um, with a lot of, if you recall from the slides uh, that we looked at earlier in, the, in, this, in this course, uh, you know, the busyness, the spikiness of Gothic, the crenellations and the gargoyles and, you know, the elaboration in stone, the flying buttresses and all of that. Renaissance architecture emphasizes clean lines and simplicity, symmetry, and especially the use of basic geometric shapes in combination with each other. Florence Cathedral here, with its massive red dome, is possibly the most important, or rather the kind of quintessential case of Renaissance architecture. Um, you can see the use of the geometric shapes here. You have these rectangles, which are sort of faux windows. Um, the round, uh, perfectly circular windows here. Uh, all along, you know, the uh, both uh, around the dome and through the nave of the church here, right? This this is a far cry from uh, from the Gothic. Um, the dome itself, you know, which may draw its inspiration from Hagia Sophia to some extent, but this dome is elongated, um, and uh, again, the emphasis on symmetry and simplicity and clean lines, and and an attempt to get back to what the Romans were doing. Right, um, we can see prob probably some similarities between this and say the Pantheon, the famous uh, temple dedicated to all of the gods in Rome, which was turned into a Christian church in late antiquity. Um, and so, you know, Florence Cathedral is a good example of that. Right, another is the Pazzi Chapel, uh, also in Florence, built uh, as the chapter house of a monastery in Florence, but built by another of these merchant families. The Pazis, who were really kind of second in wealth and prestige in Florence to the Medicis. Um, and the outside is, is rather, you know, kind of unspectacular, but notice the Roman arch here, rather than the Gothic arch, we're back to the Roman arch, which is, you know, more aesthetically pleasing, at least uh, according to the sensibilities of the time. You know, you can see the dome of the, of the chapel here with its round windows, perfectly circular windows, uh, the squares. Um, in fact, the circle and the square are combined here, much as they were uh, attempted to uh, the, the attempt to combine them. You know that we saw in Hagia Sophia, but but even sort of more uh, pushed even more architecturally um, in Pazzi Chapel. Now the interior um, is is simple, but again the emphasis on basic geometric shapes, the circle and the square um, put together. Right, um, and uh, uh, let me comment on circles and squares here for a second, uh, because we're going to look at another image here where that's going to be important. The square was seen by thinkers during the Middle Ages, in fact, all the way back to antiquity, and certainly in the Renaissance period, um, as the basic earthly shape. Uh, things on Earth move in vertical and horizontal directions, it was thought. Um, you know, water flows downhill, air goes up, fire goes up, right? Um, uh, anything solid drops in a vertical path down straight to the earth, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the 
edges of the square um, were thought to characterize the earthly sphere, the terrestrial sphere. The circle, on the other hand, was thought to be the, the shape uh, that characterized heaven, um, the area above the earth, right? Dante, uh, for instance, drawing upon precedents set by Aristotle and, and Ptolemy uh, in antiquity, uh, described heaven as a series of ten concentric spheres that were perfectly circular and perfectly symmetrical um, in orientation. Uh, and so the circle is, is the heavenly shape, right? Posse Chapel is an attempt to bring together the circle and the square, to, to make heaven and earth touch each other, right? To, to have a, a kind of locus point where people can access uh, heavenly things while remaining on earth, as it were. Um, uh, practically speaking, utilitarian uh, aspect of this was that this was the burial chapel for the Pazzi family, in addition to being the chapter house for the monks, where they would hold their meetings and, and uh, you know, lessons for novices and, and such things. But um, the, the, the building itself is this uh, very strong evocation of, of humanist thinking, the attempt to bring heaven and earth into commune with each other, right? Emphasis on the classics, one of the most famous paintings of the Renaissance is Raphael's School of Athens. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an anachronism, um, and Raphael, I think, understood what he was doing here. Uh, he has attempted in this to uh, show all of the great philosophers, the great thinkers through all of Western history here, uh, right at the center we have Socrates and Plato, or maybe it's Socrates and Aristotle. Um, I cannot recall whether... Anyway, uh, all of them are featured here. Um, and that might be Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> Sorry, that's embarrassing. I can't... Um, I mean, I, I studied this. I just can't re recall right off the top of my head who this is. Uh, in any case, um, it's not just the, the sort of triumvirate of ancient Greek philosophers who were featured here. Uh, we also have, you know, philosophers all through, um, through antiquity, um, and I'm not going to point to any specific ones because I, I frankly, you know, can't remember to identify them, but, um, uh, you know, you've got all of the, the great Latin philosophers. Cicero is de depicted here, for instance, and Horace and Seneca. Um, you have uh, St. Augustine is shown uh, here. Um, as well as some of the Muslim philosophers who were admired um, in the West, uh, Averroes and Avicenna. Um, and so, you know, this brings together all of the great minds. And notice the setting for this, right? Uh, the use of perspective. And so, you know, there's a depth. There's almost a three-dimensional uh, character to this painting. There's this kind of frame to it. And then you can see the building um, sort of... Uh, uh, moving into the distance here, or um, anyway, sense of three-dimensional space. Um, we're going to see the development of perspective even more when this moves into the northern part of Europe. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, in any case, this is, you know, attempt to bring the, the classics together all in a classical style building with your Roman arch here, right? Um, and so antiquity is just fully on display for everything that it all of the glories that it obtained. Um, the Vitruvian Man sketch by Leonardo da Vinci um, is one of the greatest statements of humanism in existence. Okay. Um, notice that the human being is not shown only um, in all of his, and this is a, a male figure, of course, not only in all of his uh, sort of potential physiological positions here, the, the uh, arm extensions and leg extensions, but one of the things that is, is often not noticed about this, unless you look carefully, is the frame for the human being, right? For the frame for the man. Uh, there is both a circle and a square. And, you know, two of the arm extensions are touching the circle and two are touching the square. Two of the feet extensions are touching the circle and two are touching the square. Um, now, what's the message here? What is da Vinci trying to capture? 
uh, well, I think, and I, I think that you know, sort of uh, an exploration of humanism will bear this out, that the man, the human being, is the thing which brings heaven and earth together. The whole purpose for the creation of the earth was to give a space for the human being to live out his or her life um, and attempt to reach heaven again. Um, and so the human being bridges the gap between uh, between the terrestrial and the celestial sphere, as it were, the earthly and the heavenly sphere. Um, and uh, therefore the human being is the proper subject of study. However, one can uh, engage with the human being, whether you know, literarily or politically uh, or artistically or in any other way. Uh, all of these things are important because man is God's ultimate creation. Man, human, the human must be understood, right? And you can see this. Da Vinci was fascinated with anatomy. Um, he dissected corpses and, and uh, did drawings of, of, of the interior of the human anatomy. You can see his sketches here of uh, the skeleton, you know, the, the, all of the pairs of ribs and, and things like this. Uh, even more, pu pushing this to an even greater extent was a contemporary of da Vinci, uh, an Italian named uh, Andreas Vesalius, um, who uh, was so fascinated with the human body that he would actually, like, wait around for um, criminals who had been sentenced to execution to die, and then he would cut their body down from the gallows or, you know, take them off of the wheel where they had been broken or however they were executed and take them back to his laboratory and cut them up um, an almost morbid fascination. But he, uh, um, he wrote this book, and it, it really the writing of the book is not important. It's the sketches he did of the human anatomy that are key here. Um, his book is known as the... Um, uh, what de fabrica corporis humani, or the on the fabric of the human body, um, would be the English translation for that. Um, and you know, he, he shows the musculature, he shows the skeletal system, he shows all of the organs of the body. Uh, you know, and and sort of at each stage of dissection, you can see he has, for instance, in this sketch, pulled back the deltoid muscle to expose some of the lower things, or maybe that's the tricep. I, I tell exactly, but you know, the skin is kind of hanging off of this here so he can show the the way that the muscles, you know, stack up against each other and their little uh, letters to, you know, that would go along with the key to identify each of these. Vesalius' drawings are so accurate that they could be used as an anatomy textbook all the way to the present. And in fact, you know, later uh, compendia like Gray's Anatomy, a uh, famous book uh, from the modern period on anatomy. We're, we're really kind of, you know, outgrowth of what Vesalius was doing in the 16th century. Uh, da Vinci's most famous painting, um, of course, is the Mona Lisa. And, uh, uh, you know, before we look at this, I want to turn to uh, one of the sources that you were assigned to read uh, for this, for this uh, week, uh, for this class, and that is the, um, uh, the life of... Leonardo da Vinci by another an Italian contemporary named Giorgio Vasari. Uh, Vasari did um, a large work called, as it says here, The Lives of the Most Eminent Italian Architects, Painters, and Sculptors, um, published around 1550. Um, and we haven't even mentioned, by the way, that this period sees the, you know, the, the uh, printing press, the invention of the printing press, um, and so the you know literature is given a massive boost by the availability of printing, the number of books printed, even in just the 50-year period between about 1450 and 1500, exceeded the number of books that were um, composed, that were produced by hand, all through the Middle Ages. That's how uh, much the growth in in literature um, was facilitated by, uh, by the printing press. Um, and that, of course, has a tremendous impact on all of this. Um, but uh, anyway, back to Vasari here. Uh, I just want to notice some of the things that he says about Leonardo. Um, uh, so he says, for instance, 
he practiced not only one branch of art only, but all those in which drawing played a part, having an intellect uh, so divine and marvelous that he was also an excellent geometrician. He not only worked in sculpture, making in his youth uh, in clay some heads of women that are smiling, um, but also in architecture, right? He did uh, all sorts of buildings, designed them, uh, and he was the first, although but a youth, who suggested the plan of reducing the river Arno to a navigable canal from Pisa to Florence. He made designs of flour mills, fulling mills, and engines. And so he's involved in kind of production of machinery and industry, um, which might be driven by the force of water, right? Um, and so da Vinci is one of these universal geniuses. He uh, was engaged in all sorts of different projects to try to improve the life um, of humankind um, to more fully realize their potential, as it were, right? Though he did have, as Vasadi points out, some flaws. Um, he, uh, so in this paragraph, he says, it's clear that Leonardo, though his comprehension of, through his comprehension of art, began many things and never finished one of them. Uh, since it seemed to him that the hand was not able to attain the perfection of art in carrying out the things which he imagined. So his uh, artistic skill, as developed and, and ingenious as it was, was not able to capture what he had in his mind, at least not to his full satisfaction, right? So uh, Vasari goes on to talk about his um, a couple of his famous paintings, the painting of The Last Supper, uh, which some of you may know, and also the, the portrait of Mona Lisa. Um, notice what he says about this. Um, in this head, whoever wished to see how closely art could imitate nature was able to comprehend it with ease, for in it were counterfeited all the minutenesses that with subtlety are able to be painted, seeing that the eyes that had that luster and watery sheen which are always seen in life, and, are, and anyway, so forth and so on. But he also goes on to say that he never finished the Mona Lisa, right? He just couldn't. Um, uh, bring himself to finish this. And he even points out the famous and enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa, uh, which has bedeviled people, you know, since it was painted in the 16th century. Um, and so, you know, notice a couple things. I mean, first of all, that, you know, he really has captured the woman who sat uh, for this. Uh, this was the wife of one of his patrons, um, and, you know, we've got perspective here, the, the kind of 3D aspect of this off into the distance. Um, you know, although there may be two different uh, uh, sceneries here, that's one of the puzzles of the Mona Lisa. It's uncertain whether he, you know, did a couple of different, one, one thing on one side and one thing on another. Um, so there's so many things about the Mona Lisa that have, as I said, fascinated and bedeviled scholars ever since. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, this is an attempt, I think, to capture the human being again, and a successful one at that. Now, the Renaissance was not confined wholly to Italy. Um, uh, while, you know, uh, poets like Petrarch were writing their poetry, um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, Botticelli and Raphael and uh, Michelangelo and da Vinci were painting and sculpting and uh, producing works of architecture. Um, you know, there, there were also figures, both literary and artistic, in Northern Europe who were uh, developing art and, and literature in their own ways. I mentioned Thomas More earlier. He was part of a circle of humanists um, centered around the great uh, Dutch humanist uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Uh, who, you know, was this uh, devout Catholic, yet at the same time very critical of the Catholic Church, a, an important figure in some ways in the kind of lead up to the Reformation period, um, but a humanist of the, the highest uh, reputation. Um, and then we have, you know, the Dutch, uh, the famous painters of the Low Countries, Dutch and, and Belgian painters. Uh, just to look at a couple of these, Jan van Eyck, um, is seen by some, at least, as the kind of the father of perspective, um, where there is a depth to his paintings. Um, this may be his most famous work. It's called the Arnolfini Portrait. 
Uh, the subject here is an Italian merchant uh, with the surname Arnolfini. Um, Italian merchants were often very busy in the Low Countries. They had, uh, you know, the, the powerful merchant families of Italy had branch offices and operations in places like uh, Antwerp and Bruges and Rotterdam and, and Amsterdam. Um, which was, you know, this is the second most urbanized region of Europe, so it makes sense that there would be kind of connections between the two. Uh, so this is, a, you know, his, his Italian patron here, um, and, you know, the patron's wife as well, who was uh, quite obviously pregnant. Um, uh, one of the things that is notable about this is that, um, and it's difficult to see, I think, on this, you'd have to look for, you know, a more detailed uh, uh, picture, but over here in the back of the painting, between the couple, in fact, is a mirror. And he has shown not only the backs of the backside of the couple, but also himself. There is a canvas there, and the painter himself is looking in the mirror. Right? This is um, seen by some at least as the you know the development of the sense of individuality. Uh, the painter as participant in his work, and also perspective, right? That there is, again, a depth to this painting, a three-dimensional quality to this painting. Von Eyck developed that uh, even more so in other paintings. This is the Madonna and Chancellor Roland painting. Uh, the, the patron here, Chancellor Roland, um, uh, is shown sort of venerating the Madonna and child, uh, Mary and, and the baby Jesus. Uh, there's an angel here who is placing the crown on Mary's head. Mary is seen as the queen of heaven, right? But uh, what's in the background is just as important in some ways. And there's a lot of symbolism to this, you know, uh, a lot of uh, symbolic figures, animals and such. Um, uh, but, you know, we can see the depth here um, that, you know, there is a world outside that goes on. These are not flat figures. They are shown in perspective. Um, my fa favorite artist personally of this whole period, um, and in fact my favorite artist period of all time, uh, I may say something about my own tastes, but is the uh, painter Hieronymus Bosch, um, also from the Low Countries, though he did a lot of his work uh, under the patronage of um, uh, the Spanish kings. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, the Garden of Early Delights is on display in the Prado in Madrid, like I said. Um, uh, but Bosch um, is a tremendously enigmatic figure. Um, his paintings sort of defy explanation often. There's a, a tremendous amount of symbolism to these things, uh, which, you know, Bosch didn't explain fully necessarily. Um, You've got a lot of fruit imagery here, for instance. So over here we have, you know, the creation of Adam and Eve, but there's also a sense from this that, uh, you know, this creation is sort of doomed to fail, doomed to fall, as it were. The center panel here shows uh, kind of earth as it is, where people are pursuing their lusts. The fruit is, is kind of a symbol for lust here. Um, and you've got a like cult of people worshiping a strawberry up here, for instance. Uh, you've got people riding various animals, um, including some fantastical animals. There's a there's a hippogriff here, for instance, for you Harry Potter fans. Um, there are pigs and other things that people are riding, uh, um, and there seems to be a sort of procession around this central pool here. There are a lot, a lot of bird imagery. Birds are seen, especially owls and other things are seen as sinister. You know, there's an owl right here in the middle of this um, water feature, uh, which is a sort of symbol of an impending doom, as it were, for the creation of, of the human being. And then over here we have hell, right, so where many humans are destined to go, including you'll see a number of clerical figures. There are nuns wearing their wimples and priests with their... Priests and monks with their tonsures. Here we have a pig wearing a, a nun's wimple, for instance, and you know they're they're being subjected to various tortures. There's a lot of strange figures here. Uh, musical instruments feature with some of these. Sometimes they're object of torture. This is a person who's sort of impaled on the strings of a harp, right? Uh, a set of bagpipes up here. 
uh, a pair of ears with a knife sticking out, right? Uh, what sense do we make of all of this? Um, you know, there's a lot of artistic technique to this. You know, the, again, the, the uh, three-dimensional quality to this, the perspective. Uh, Bosch was painting this right around 1500, maybe a few years after that. Um, so taking his cues from von Eich, who was a couple generations before that. Um, here's a close-up of some of the details of hell. And uh, I almost hate to end on a picture of hell here. Hopefully this class has not been hell for you. Uh, hopefully it's been enjoyable, that you've learned some things. Um, but, uh, you know, the Renaissance is this enigmatic period. And, uh, you know, it's one that I think we have to see continuity and change simultaneously. Uh, some things that are new, but some things that remain the same um, all through this fascinating, you know, long uh, stretch of... Um, history uh, of Western civilization, and, and so hopefully this is this is all um, helped to, um, this whole class, in fact, has helped to uh, understand, you know, the human condition better, uh, to locate ourselves in this broad, broad stretch of history.